just a little disclaimer before we keep going. The language in this story, because it was written in 1961, is a little bit dated. Some words that are not socially acceptable now were used in everyday language during the time when this book was written. So if you have any questions, let me know. And without further ado, here we go. Chapter 6. Peter Adopts a Disguise Back in the tunnel, Pamela, Patsy, and Peter waited and waited and waited. Pamela had watched Penny's thin form silhouetted against the light at the end of the tunnel. She had seen it stop, climb over something, move on, and disappear. She tried to show that she wasn't worried, for she did not want to scare the little ones, but she was growing desperately uneasy. Come on, said Patsy. Let's get moving. I'm hungry, Peter announced. Pamela remembered the little jars and boxes of candies she had taken from the cupboards. When she pulled them from her pockets, they were a little bit gooey from having been in the water, but they were better than nothing. She divided them up carefully, saving two portions for Penny and the polywog. The three children began to stuff the sweet, sticky mass into their mouths. Then Peter remembered their prisoner. Here, Og, he said amiably. You can have one of mine. The green man was still laying on his stomach and trying without success to wriggle out of his bonds. He took the small candy that Peter put in his mouth and licked it gratefully. There he is on his tummy. Come on, let's get moving, Patsy said again. No, Pamela said firmly. Penny told us to stay here. She was really very worried now, and this was a new sensation for Pamela, who seldom worried about anything. But then she had never been in charge of anything before. It had always been Penny, and now Penny was gone. Pamela felt her eyebrows knit up into a little frown. She had seen just such a frown on Penny's face many a time, and often she had wondered why Penny frowned like that. Now she knew. It's really not much fun being the boss, Pamela thought to herself. She realized that pretty soon she would have to make some sort of decision. Penny had been gone for some time, and Pamela was certain that something sinister had happened to her. She and the other two children could not stay here, on a narrow ledge in a dark tunnel and in wet clothes, for much longer. Come on, Patsy chirped for the third time. Let's get crackin'. It was a phrase she had heard her father use more than once. She did not quite know what it meant, but it sounded suitably active. It was Patsy, not Peter, who was going to be the problem, Pamela realized. The little boy, quite unconcerned, was lying on his stomach next to Og and pushing his boat around in the water. Brrrr, he said to himself, in my motorboat crossing the Atlantic Ocean. I think maybe we had all better move up toward the light, Pamela said at last. What about him, said Peter, pointing to Og. Pamela realized with a sigh that she must make another decision. <sighs> well, she said at last, we'll just have to leave him here. Now come on. Stay close together and don't make any noise. Og, said Og in a plaintive way. Here, said Peter generously. You can play with my boat while we're gone. And he set it down about an inch from Og's nose. As they left, Peter looked back and saw that the sharp-nosed Og was staring fixedly at the boat as if hypnotized. His eyes, Peter noted, were crossed like Patsy's. Peter wished he could cross his eyes like that. The three children moved silently along the damp ledge, stopping every few minutes to listen. How angry Penny would be, thought Pamela, if it turned out that she was perfectly all right after all. Maybe they were gumming up some secret plan by disobeying orders. After all, Penny had been very firm about the three of them staying put until she returned. 
Oh dear, Pamela thought. It's very difficult making decisions. I hear a little splash, Patsy whispered. It was true. There was a sloshing sound just ahead. The children stopped and huddled close to the wall, not knowing quite what to do. Something soft touched Pamela's hand and she jumped in fright. She was about to scream, but then remembered that she couldn't because she was the leader. It's Yuki, said Peter. He went with Penny. I saw him. Pamela had been so busy thinking and planning that she had forgotten about the little dog. Now she recognized him with relief. Yuki, where's Penny? The dog growled softly and turned his head toward the tunnel, looked back at Pamela for a moment, and then started to move toward the light at the end. Something has happened, Pamela said. He's trying to lead us. I told you he'd protect us, Peter said. The three children followed the dog, climbing over the net and noting, with curiosity, the little boats still moored in the channel. At the edge of the tunnel, Yukon King stopped. The three children stopped behind him. Then the dog squeezed quietly around a big rock at the entrance and turned his head as a signal for the children to follow. They did so and found themselves under an enormous clump of giant pink mushrooms. Yukon King poked his black nose out between two of the great stalks and looked around. Pamela peered out with him and saw, unfolded before her, the same vista that had awed Penny the great waterfall, the river winding off into the distance, the copses of brightly colored mushrooms and the bridges and the road, the strange bright houses and the green people, tiny dots below moving about in the soft glow. Yukon King gave a low growl and Pamela saw two green men climbing up the steps beside the waterfall directly below her. She motioned the others to lie flat and keep quiet. The two little men passed within a foot or so of the mushroom patch. Pamela noticed to her surprise that they were both wearing Davy Crockett coonskin caps. Peter and Patsy had once owned a couple just like them when the craze was at its height. The two little men disappeared into the tunnel. We've got to move, Pamela whispered. They'll find Og back there and he'll tell them we're out here. Hurry. He can't tell them much, said Patsy. All he can say is og, 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 og. That's all he can say. As she spoke, Yukon King was wriggling flat on his belly toward the next copse of mushrooms. He looked over his shoulder at Pamela and she beckoned the others to follow. It's just like being Indians, Patsy whispered in delight as they crawled after him. The little dog was leading them along the edge of a sort of ridge that seemed to dominate the village of round huts below. They moved in this fashion for several hundred yards from copse to copse until they reached a spot just overlooking the edge of the settlement. Yukon King growled again and pointed downward with his nose as he had seen bird dogs do in father's copy of True Lies, the man's magazine. Pamela looked below and saw a cave tucked away in the edge of the hillside at the point where it curved around behind the settlement. I believe he's trying to tell us that Penny is down there, she said. Well, come on, said Patsy. Let's go. But Pamela was not to be hurried. She was looking the situation over carefully and trying to decide on the best course of action. Supposing the green people had captured Penny in the polywog, as seemed likely. Then Pamela and the others must at all costs avoid being captured. But how could they stay out of the green men's clutches and at the same time free the prisoners, if they were prisoners? Certainly not by plunging ahead without some sort of plan. 
In the first place, the slope below them was bare of any cover. Anybody going down that way would be spotted at once. In the last Mad Monsters story, Pamela remembered Garth Greatheart had disguised himself as a red Martian and moved freely among the enemy. But then Garth Greatheart had unlimited access to expensive costumes. He was always changing his shirt in alleyways and putting on that ridiculous blue cloak and hypnotizing people by wiggling his fingers. Pamela had a feeling that if Garth Greatheart was on the spot now, he would make a mess of things. Penny's in that cave down there, Pamela said to the others. I'm sure of it. From the way Yuki is growling and pointing, they've probably got her locked up. Then we'll just go down and get her out, said Patsy. It's not that easy. They'd spot us, sure. They're green, you know, and we're white. Well, said Patsy, we could be green too. And she pulled the tube of green paint out of her pocket. I was going to use it to paint some of my frogs, but you can have it, she said. The frogs are pretty green anyway. Pamela took the paint and thought a moment. It won't work, she said at last, shaking her head. We're much too big. They'd still spot us. Pam, said Peter, tugging at her shorts. Let me go. I'm little. He is too, said Patsy. He's really little. It was true. Peter was the exact height of the green people, though much stockier, Pamela realized. All right, she said, making up her mind suddenly. We can't just sit here and do nothing. Pete, you're going to be a spy. We'll color you green and you go down below. Try to find Penny and see if she knows where Polly is. Tell her where we are and then report back. And don't forget Earless Osdick, said Patsy. Oh dear, said Pamela. I forgot about him. That makes one more. She realized, with something close to panic, that the tight little group which had started out was slowly becoming separated. Osdick, Paul, Penny, and now Peter. She didn't like the idea of this. On the other hand, she couldn't see any better plan than the one they had adopted. Pamela felt about five years older than she had when they started down the tunnel from the playhouse. She wished that it was she, not Peter, who was going down below. But she knew this to be impossible. She was too big. Let's get the paint on Peter, she said. Peter took off his t-shirt. She and Patsy began to squeeze gobs of the paint out onto their hands and rub it into Peter's body. They colored his tummy and chest and his back and his arms green. His shorts were green already, but his legs and his face and even his hair had to be made quite green. When all the paint had been used, Pamela stepped back and had a look at him. Well, she said slowly, you might just get away with it, Pete, though you're awfully sticky. Peter felt quite pleased. Like all red-blooded boys, he had always wanted to paint himself green, but being a good child, he had fought the desire. Now, at last, he had achieved a small ambition. Try not to be too long, Pamela whispered. We'll wait right here, okay? Sure, said Peter. He stepped out of the mushroom copse and started down the slope, then he came back. I forgot my tractor, he said. Oh, Peter, at a time like this. He grabbed around in the sand, found it, and then began to clamber easily down the long slopes, picking his way between the big boulders and through the clumps of brightly colored mushrooms until he reached the roadway below. Because of the steepness of the cliff, he did not go directly downward but moved in an angle back toward the river. Thus, when he reached the base of the hill, he was no longer directly below the children's hiding place, but quite close to the flight of steps down which Penny had been led by her captors. He stopped in the shade of a great clump of scarlet mushrooms. 
The soft light filtered down through them, glowing redly on his green features and giving him the dark look of a small, copper-colored Indian. Peter looked about him carefully, got his bearings, and then stepped boldly from the shadows. Wham! He collided headlong with a small, scurrying green figure also coming down from the hill, and the two of them staggered back at the force of the blow. Peter was the first to recover his breath, and as he did so, he looked straight into the impish and angry features of Og, the man whom not half an hour ago they had left neatly trussed up inside the tunnel. Here's the girls painting Peter green. And here is a map. Playhouse, tunnel, river, waterfall. Cave. Oh, and the girl's hiding place is right here, and they're watching it all. <laughs>